Today we have Joe McQuarrie, M.A.T. elder, whose mother is from Red River. And if you listen to her as an elder, the Creator will give you a lot of good stuff to take with you. And here she is, Joe McQuarrie. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, as um, I'm very happy to be here, also very nervous to be here. The, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was recognized as a, a Métis elder by the Métis Nation of um, Ontario a few years ago, and I thought I couldn't be an elder because I wasn't old enough. <laughs> But they said, oh, it's not about age, it's about wisdom. And I thought, oh, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I accepted the, uh, the honor. Um, by day, I'm a community outreach liaison with the Métis Nation of uh, Ontario. And by night, I represent the um, MNO at, uh, I'm a member of various boards and committees in town. I'm also um, a member of the Police Services Compact Committee. It's a race relations and diversity group. The committee is made up of uh, representatives from most of the ethnic groups in, in Ottawa, and it's a very lively, and we partner with the, uh, the police, so that if there's a difficulty in a particular community, um, the, uh, we usually um, help to advise the police on what ought to be done and uh, also we sort of act as a buffer, a support to the community that we're from and also um, a buffer between the two because uh, sometimes the police don't always get along with, uh, with communities that are under stress. I've, uh, um, I'm also a, a, a chaplain with the police services spiritual team. And I'm from Edmonton. Um, my heritage is uh, Cree and French. And um, my spirit name is Lady Swan. It was given to me by a Cherokee medicine person. And I haven't met him, but uh, this was emailed to me. <laughs> I thought, hmm, Lady Swan. Um, I've had difficulty finding uh, information about that uh, legendary uh, person or, or myth, a uh, mythic person or a spiritual person in the uh, Cherokee um, legends and mythology. But um, I, I think it's because I exhibit a, a very calm exterior as a swan sailing down the, the river, <laughs> but underneath I'm paddling like hell. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so I think it was suitable. Um, my parents passed away when I was a child. Um, my mother uh, had tuberculosis and was away at the, the sanatorium in Calgary for a long time. And I, didn't, I hadn't seen her since uh, I was five years old. The, um, my father passed away when I was 12. And I went to, I had stayed in a convent, I lived in a convent for, from the age of five until 10 years. And then I, uh, my father um, took my brother and I out of the convent and we lived with him for a couple of years. Um, when, uh, and since I was an orphan, uh, by that time, um, I went to live with my brother and his family and lived with them until I uh, left to enter nursing school. My, um, I'm a registered nurse with postgraduate studies in psychiatric nursing and, um, and community development. Um, we, after I uh, got married, we moved to Baker Lake in the, uh, the Northwest Territories where my husband had accepted a job as principal of the uh, day school there. And uh, we stayed, at that time, the Canadian government didn't hire nurses. 
they imported nurses from Australia and uh, Britain uh, because they were primarily wanting to hire midwives. And, uh, but there's more to nursing than just midwifery. And the school that I trained at, um, it was a rural hospital, so we had a lot of uh, experience in delivering babies. So, but I worked as a volunteer at the nursing station because often I, my experience was broader than the, the uh, nurse who was specialized in, in midwifery. But um, so I did a number of medevacs and whatnot, and. Uh, and during the time in the North, I worked primarily with uh, Inuit, but have a lot of experience with working with the Dene as well. Um, I was, of course, very concerned about mental health services um, because uh, in the long hours of uh, darkness in the winter, there was people who are prone to become depressed and. Um, and just unstable, and would um, be shipped out to a hospital in the south. And then when spring came, they would be back. <laughs> and I didn't want that to happen to me. I, uh, when we moved to Yellowknife, it was the promised land, of course, after living in Baker and uh, where there was um, no communication with the outside. Um, there was no radio or television or anything like that. And um, we still got the Edmonton Journal, but they would be stacked up and we'd, we would read them sort of day by day, <laughs> although they were probably weeks late uh, in coming. But uh, the, uh, the postal service was also very poor. Anyway, um, our, one of the, I had always wanted to go north, and one of the things that we thought would be useful for our children was, would be to grow up as a minority in a community. Um, and uh, so they, uh, I think, I'm trying to think of how old they were. Oh, uh, we were Catholics, by the way. So my eldest child is a daughter, and she's, uh, she was uh, six. And uh, my son was five, and my other son was four. <laughs> So, um, and then we, uh, I had to go out um, uh, the following year to have our fourth child. The, um, I think they appreciated the experience of uh, living in a small community and uh, just sort of morphed into, they didn't know they were different, and I don't think they are really, but it was a good experience for all of us to be there. And uh, people that we met when, when we stepped off the plane in Baker Lake, I'm very proud to say are many of them are still our friends. And some are living in, uh, in Ottawa these days. So we still have that good connection. The, uh, so life went on. And in Yellowknife, I, being concerned about mental health services, I. I didn't know a soul when we went there, and, and my husband was off at work, and I was housebound with my children. And uh, so I um, thought I'd check around to see what mental health services were available. And the only thing that was available was a psychiatrist from, um, from uh, where was he from? Edmonton, I think, who would come out to. Uh, once a month for a day, and some, it was less than a day actually, and we'd hear on CBC radio that the psychiatrist is in. Anyone w wishing to see him come to the nursing station between these hours. And um, I had joined a Toastmistress group and really admired the, the women who were participating in that. They were career women and just, just wonderful. And, uh, but by, <laughs> By January, they were all shipped out. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear, <laughs> that's going to happen to me and I don't want to go. But uh, as it turned out, uh, I phoned around uh, with the help of a, a nurse that I worked with. I worked nights at the hospital. Um, to uh, She knew the community so well. She had lived there uh, a long time. And so we... Uh, 
phoned around and called together a meeting of people who were interested in addressing the issues of uh, mental health services. And what came of that, I was very enthusiastic about it until the woman from the YWCA said, well, where's the meeting? And I thought, oh, I didn't have a venue. <laughs> that was how um, inexperienced I was. But anyway, we had the first meeting at the, uh, at the YWCA in Yellowknife. And out of that came the, um, we didn't have any money. And to this day, I don't believe that you need money to start an organization. I think that if you have people of, even three people of, uh, uh, who are concerned about mutual items, then, um, then you can address it. And uh, I'm very, uh, um, I'm a proponent of volunteer services because I believe that uh, volunteers, uh, if you volunteer your time to help somebody, you really are helping yourself. Even if your only uh, return is a feeling of self-satisfaction for having helped somebody. So we, we uh, started the uh, off as the NWT Mental Health Association, which then became um, the Canadian Mental Health uh, Association of the Northwest Territories. We had a lot of uh, um, support from the uh, CMHA, but we didn't know if we wanted to even align ourselves with them. We were going to do our own thing, but then it made sense to um, to use their resources, which they generously offered, to begin what we wanted to do. And some of the spin-offs from the work of uh, we had uh, the, our board of directors uh, was made up of uh, people from across the territories. That was, of course, way before Nunavut. And uh, so I don't know how we did it. Oh, CN uh, gave us their free uh, telephone services. And so we were able to communicate by, by radio phone or telephone. The um, spin-offs were the, the detox center that was built. And uh, the original name for the detox, because our committee was so busy, we were concerned, I think, basically that um, at night, we would have the uh, street people who were intoxicated um, come to the hospital, but we didn't have beds for them, so they would sleep on mattresses in the hallways. And we had to make extra rounds to make sure that uh, they didn't aspirate or, you know, um, get worse. And uh, I was fussing about, well, we need some place for, uh, to treat them, and just an overnight nap on a mattress so I wasn't going to do it. So some businessmen got together and uh, they wanted the liquor, uh, uh, the, the license to sell liquor, but they said that they would use their profits for this uh, detox. And we envisioned this duplex, intox and detox. <laughs> <laughs> but they were going to, the original name was Joe's Flop House uh, <laughs> because they thought they were doing me a favor. <laughs> Um, the uh, the next uh, group that we fostered was the there were some of our volunteers who thought they that we needed a Montessori school so that soon developed and I believe is still running. We were also concerned about council the disabled people and uh, their ability to get around, and so we formed the Council for Disabled and I, they call it something something. I think it's the Council for Community Living now, but it's, uh, it's been a terrific success. Uh, we also had a distress line, and um, those are still going. And um, we developed branches in the different uh, communities, like Iqaluit and Fort Smith and those places. And um, we were concerned about the building of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline. And our concern was that what would happen to the, um, our project was called the people in the pipeline. What would happen to the people if, um, if, if the pipeline went through and they're caught in this rapid industrialization for which uh, there was no infrastructure to uh, support them if, uh, if they did have uh, serious problems or any problems at all? 
And so I, uh, Mr. Justice Berger um, uh, gave me the, um, uh, I don't know whether it was a curse or a blessing, 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 <laughs> to uh, appear before the, the Kenzie Valley Pipeline and, and the ability to cross-examine the witnesses and uh, make our re recommendations to the inquiry. So uh, I didn't travel with them because we had volunteers in the other communities uh, who could speak for themselves about their concerns uh, with rap rapid industrialization. So um, I'm, I made the arrangements for our various volunteers as uh, Mr. Berger was traveling around to appear before the inquiry abdicating for the people who would be negatively affected by the building of the pipeline. And in the final report, uh, Mr. Justice Berger included all of our recommendations, as well as uh, one of them was to delay the pipeline, uh, the building of the pipeline, until the infrastructure was in place so that there would be social services and all the things that people need. Um, and. Uh, we needed a social in infrastructure and services um, to support the people during the, the time of the rapid development. And uh, we were very thankful that he, in his final report, he, um, like we didn't, we weren't protesting the building of the pipeline as much as let's take care of the people first. And um, he delayed the building of the pipeline for 10 years. And I think it must be 30 or 40 years by now, and it's still not built, which is a good thing. Um, my career in the North was, um, my family was, of course, the, the major uh, item in, uh, in my work. And, uh, but I began, I worked for the, uh, the Stanton Hospital at night. And um, I uh, also um, did all kinds of other things. I was on the separate school board, the, um, and then on the Sir John Franklin school board. And these were building, um, they were in their infancy, and so we had a lot of development to do and, and uh, things to do in that regard. The, um, I was the, I moved over to work for um, the department, it was the, the Department of Health and Social Services um, as a mental health consultant and we hired, we couldn't call them um, psychiatric nurses but they, they really were but we called them mental health workers. So I had a staff of five and they were in one in each of the regions across the north. It, that was including Nunavut of course. Um, one of the things that we found, and you will find quite likely in your research, is that um, the people in small communities, um, or indigenous uh, people generally, still adhere to uh, their cultural beliefs and, uh, and interpret, uh, like they, it's not on the surface in a lot of cases, but um, if, you, uh, if you probe deeper, uh, you will find that, uh, well, I guess it's like like us. Um, we're, uh, we don't believe in all that stuff <laughs> until there's a crisis. And then we go back to uh, what worked for us in the past. And if that is uh, summon, summoning summon the, uh, the various spirits to, to be with us, uh, we can do that. And uh, I think it's like when we're passing on to the next world, um, we suddenly uh, contact the God or the Creator to help us through, whereas we may not have given God or the Creator a second thought for many years, but we revert back to that old behavior. And um, if you're researching in those communities, in some communities, and I'm thinking primarily of uh, Aboriginal communities, you will, um, you have to be very, 
you have to notice how different um, that that is uh, their basic belief system is cultural, but um, they might be. Um, I had a, a patient once who was, uh, she was a teenager uh, from one of the communities and she had, uh, she was just an, an ordinary teenager. She was going to high school at Acacia Hall and she, uh, uh, she became pregnant and we got her uh, in for the delivery and she was healthy. Oh, she was a beautiful woman and just so healthy and like her delivery should have just gone like clockwork, but uh, she began uh, labor and uh, uh, properly, but then stopped. And we did a, uh, we had to do a C-section. And when uh, she, when she was conscious, she uh, rejected her baby. She didn't want to see it. She didn't want to talk to us. She wanted to do anything. She did not want to do anything. But we had, uh, and we had to get her up every day. Like she wouldn't eat or drink or do any of the things that you're supposed to do when, after surgery. And uh, it was um, it would take two or three of us to get her out of bed and drag her down the hallway because she had to move. And, uh, and it was really uh, disconcerting for us. And um, so I happened to go back to the hospital after supper one night to see how she was doing, and um, there was she had a visitor who was a nurse from the community that she was from, and the nurse said, "Well, um, you know, uh, you you must know of the curse." <laughs> no, <laughs> didn't know it, <laughs> but apparently um, um, there is a there is a community or was a community that had some medicine people who were active. There were um, they practiced good medicine and bad medicine. And one of the bad medicine workers had laid a curse on this because they had a dispute with her parents. And the, the curse was that she would, um, she would have her baby, but um, she would have to uh, go through a very difficult period. Uh, and, and actually, the, the baby would live, but uh, it had to do this, that, and the other thing. So um, her family uh, contacted the the good medicine people in the community and said, look, you know, what can we do? And they studied the case and they said there wasn't anything they could do because the, the medicine was too powerful for them. And, um, but they could, you know, the baby would be alive. She would probably suffer for three or four days. But after that, she would be fine. So uh, once we knew that, our attitude as nurses just totally changed. We were really sympathetic. We sort of were before, but also frustrated by the fact that she didn't respond to our wonderful nursing care. But, uh, but as the uh, third day rolled around, she, it was the fourth day that she really was um, alive and happy to, and wanted to see her baby, wanted to do all the things that mothers want to do. And uh, we were totally amazed. And I felt always that we should have had that information beforehand. And I found it was the same with uh, uh, some of the mentally ill people that came across my path. There was a woman uh, from one of the communities who um, every spring during the ratting season, she was shipped out um, to the uh, mental hospital in Edmonton. And she was coming through, and her daughter called me to, to say that um, she didn't want her mother to, there was, a, she had to wait for a plane for about eight hours. She didn't want her mother to be in jail during that time. And could I, she could stay at the hospital and the, her daughter could stay with her. So I phoned around and so anyway, the, um, the police agreed that she, probably jail wasn't the place for her. So she, um, I got the story from the daughter, uh, finally, who um, said that, well, she goes out every year because a few years back she had bought uh, medicine from, um, from a medicine person in the community so that she would have good luck uh, and success during the ratting season. And the deal was that she was to return that medicine to, to the medicine person at the 
you know, after a few years. But if she didn't, it would curse her. So one year while she was out in the bush, uh, the medicine person died. So she didn't have an opportunity to return the, the medicine. So she believed she was cursed during the ratting season, and the community were afraid of her. I think she was afraid of herself. So uh, by the time I got this story, it was, she was already uh, had been admitted to the hospital. I had phoned the community to the parish priest to see if there was something they could do in the community, like a ceremony of some kind that would release that, that medicine or that, that curse. And he said, oh, no, we don't believe in that. Oh, that's nonsense. You know, she's a good Catholic woman. She's at church every day, blah, blah, blah. So I <laughs> looked further. And what had happened was that uh, she had attacked her husband with an axe. Um, she was, um, and that's why she was being shipped out. Well, other reasons, I guess, but this was kind of the last straw. Uh, he was um, admitted to the nursing station in that community, and she was taken off to Edmonton. The, um, so I phoned the psychiatrist, <laughs> and he said, oh, I, I'm just meeting with her. She's a lovely woman. And I said, well, did you get her chart and her history? Oh, that's not necessary. She's been here before. And uh, so I said, well, did you know? And he said, oh, that can't be true. She speaks English well. Uh, on, and she's making a belt, beading a belt for me. I thought, I was so, you know, get real, guy. <laughs> you don't know who you're dealing with. And uh, anyway, the, uh, to make a long story short, she got well, came back, the community welcomed her back, but they were still uneasy during uh, the ratting season. And uh, when, one year, I had been working with an RCMP guy, so he had the whole story. But as it turned out, one year, I heard on CBC radio, because that's all we got up there, that uh, she had disappeared. And um, she had gone ratting with two of her nephews, and uh, they didn't know what happened to her. She just sort of disappeared. And he and I both agreed that it was probably a ritual murder. I think the community had finally gotten tired of this and of being afraid and this whole thing repeating year after year. And um, it's just unfortunate that they, they had enough uh, resources in the community in terms of the medicine people and who know all about this kind of thing to have um, lifted that, that curse from her and she'd probably still be alive today. So those are the kinds of things that we dealt with uh, as a, a mental health organization and also as um, we also did the first uh, uh, mental health study in the, the north and uh, there were two um, uh, researchers from the University of Saskatchewan who donated their time to meet with our board to sit down and for, uh, develop a questionnaire that was suitable to the um, communities that would be assessed. The, uh, um, we hired uh, individuals in the, uh, in the community to go door to door uh, with the questionnaires. We also had them, these researchers meet with the community beforehand uh, to, to let them know what it was all about and to get their, their um, support in order to carry this out. When the, um, and we um, ensured that the results were received a, a, a proper vetting by our board of directors, which, as I mentioned, was made up of all these different uh, representatives from across the north. So it was very effective. And uh, we began getting, after it was over, uh, and the researchers went back to their to their community, the people in each of the communities were calling us and saying, well, can't you get an, another grant? We, they really enjoyed having these uh, people come to their, to their homes to interview them. And they missed the visit and, and the cups of tea and whatnot, and especially in the winter. And uh, so it was very, very successful. Um, Another survey that we did just in the Delta, in the Western Arctic, was um, 
on how the people looked at mental health. Because they were, the people in the Western Arctic uh, didn't have um, the difficulties that the uh, people uh, on the west coast of Hudson Bay had. And, uh, they, uh, and the Inuit look at uh, mental illness in a totally different manner. And it's really important that you know how the community regards them, this, uh, this illness. There were more suicides in, in the Eastern Arctic than there were um, in the West. And in asking around, like, why is this? Like, there were literally none in the Cambridge Bay area. And, uh, and it was because there was a road out. People weren't totally cut off from the south. They could get in their truck or whatever and, and go to Edmonton or wherever just to, to get out. And um, so that was a theory. On one of my other adventures, I was chief coroner in the Northwest Territories for a number of years. And we kept statistics on suicides. And um, the, uh, we had, um, it's a lay coroner system there. And we had uh, coroners, um, indigenous coroners in each of the communities across the north. And it was a very difficult job for them because they would be dealing with people, well, their neighbors and relatives um, who um, they'd known all their lives. And all we had to give them for their trouble was a $50 stipend. And they wouldn't take it for the most part because they felt that they didn't want to um, make any money from the misery of of the people that they were dealing with. So um, it was a very good system. We held a number of, uh, of inquests into the deaths just to ensure that people knew, um, you know, how, how um, um, rumors develop and spread and whatnot. And, um, and often it's totally based on poor information or none at all. And. Uh, I held a, an inquest into the death of a, an oblate priest who uh, was found dead in the basement of the church. And he had all kinds of uh, scratches on his body that you can't really reach, but they were really deep and whatnot. And some people thought that uh, he had been murdered. And the church is... Uh, um, and a lot of people saw him because he didn't come up for mass that morning. And some of them went down to see him and, and saw his body. We shipped him out for an autopsy, of course. But um, um, it was a, a suicide. He had um, his uh, uh, stomach was just packed with uh, 292s and whatnot. And uh, they hadn't even had time to digest, I guess. But anyway, we felt the church said he had, oh, you know, poor father, he died of a heart attack. He worked so hard for you guys, blah, blah, blah. So we had to, in consultation with the church in Yellowknife, um, we felt that we had to set the record straight. And so we did have a, I got a poison pen letter from um, a, an oblate priest somewhere who said, uh, that the oblates had been in, in power, not in power, power but in, you know, preaching the gospel for 300 years, and they had never, ever had a suicide. So what are you talking about, lady? I thought, oh, you got one now. But anyway, so I woke up one morning thinking to myself, oh, and in the meantime, I became a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I was on city council for a, a number of years, and uh, the uh, and then I left to uh, develop the health boards in the uh, Katikmiut and the Kiwaitan regions. My mandate with the department from the Department of Health was, well, just go to Rankin and see what you can do. I mean, do what you think is best. And I had never had a mandate like that, and I thought, why not? So off I went. But the, 
the federal government was devolving health services to the territorial government, and the territorial government didn't want them, so they devolved them to the Inuit. And I was supposed to go over and tell them that, but the uh, person who ran Northern Health from Churchill in the Kiwi thought that I was a, a female activist of some kind who was just there to ruin his life. <laughs> Fortunately, the Inuit <laughs> welcomed me, <laughs> and, but they couldn't believe that they would have uh, the uh, ability to change their, uh, to run their own health services. They just couldn't realize that, yeah, it's, it's yours. <laughs> you can hire and fire and do all these things and improve your health services, and it went on. And um, so it took me, two years in the Kuwaitan region to uh, reactivate the local health committees and to set up the board. And the, the people who were, uh, the Inuit who were involved were, were just, just phenomenal. And they were volunteers too. They were just so concerned about the level of health services they were receiving. So after we got staff hired for, for the, uh, for the board, I went over to the uh, Katikmiut region, that's Cambridge Bay, to do the same thing there. And it didn't take me quite as long because uh, <laughs> I kind of knew what I was doing. <laughs> so, uh, and the people were, were very receptive to um, taking over the health services. I've heard that it's since gone, I mean, it functioned very well for a number of years, but then the Nunavut government decided they wanted to, wanted to run things from Iqaluit. And um, uh, somehow it's not, uh, the local people don't have the, the same amount of authority that they had back then when they were doing it themselves. The, um, um, and at my last job in the North was as uh, I was on city council. When I came back from the regions to Yellowknife, uh, the council, the, uh, since I had been a, a one of the um, aldermen was leaving uh, midterm, and so the um, city council uh, asked me if I would fill out that term, uh, just so that they could avoid a. Um, by-election. So I thought I would do that, and so I did. The, um, the other thing, and I was on the, the, the hospital board as well, so anyway, life sort of settled back into the, uh, um, away from the communities. The, um, after being a, a coroner for so long, I woke up one morning and I thought, there must be more to life than death. <laughs> and uh, so I uh, decided that uh, I would go back home to Edmonton because my, while I was in the North, my nieces and nephews had grown up and were getting married. And I had kind of lost track of some of the years that I would have shared with them had I stayed home. but. Um, and sort of retirement was on the horizon too. And uh, anyway, I went home, I went back to Edmonton. And I had always wanted a five bedroom house in the suburbs. So I bought one. <laughs> Myself and my two cats moved in. <laughs> we had lots of visitors. And, <laughs> but uh, then the, I think the Inuit probably realized that I had left the North. And uh, I had three job offers in Ottawa. One was from uh, ITK. Another was the, the, uh, the Inuit were beginning to send uh, patients out here, but they needed a, a, the, uh, the hospital needed a, a nurse to help them settle in and all that stuff. And also, I had been working with a guy in, in, uh, in Edmonton to uh, prepare a proposal for the building of uh, um, Largo Baffin House here. 
and uh, he said that once it was built, which would take a couple of years, he wanted me to manage it. So I had no idea, uh, no desire to leave my five-bedroom house. <laughs> There's a lot of maintenance to five-bedroom homes, though. <laughs> but, um, but I thought it might be a sign. I wasn't looking for work, and these three requests came in. And so I decided that I would take the job with ITK. And uh, so that's how I came to Ottawa. They uh, were moving their health services from uh, Park to, to to under their their umbrella. So, and I didn't know that there were um, some issues there. I thought it was just you know what they decided to do. But as it turned out, um, I set up their their health uh, programs for them. And uh, we held the first uh, Inuit uh, meeting with, uh, with the government. And in preparation for this meeting, uh, we, um, we wanted to develop um, a partnership with uh, Health Canada. But the people I was working with on the committee, um, uh, Health Canada people, uh, said, no, 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 it's not a partnership. It's a relationship. <laughs> but I had, so we developed this proposal, and I had last say on um, the last edit. So I just took out relationship and put in partnership. <laughs> and so Alan Rock was the minister at the time. So when he was uh, opening the, uh, the conference, he said, uh, Oh, and this is the first meeting we've had with the, the Inuit, and our partnership is going to thrive. <laughs> and so anyway, and it did. So anyway, the, um, I was there for quite a while, and uh, um, then moved to, uh, I discovered I was Métis, and I thought I should go and help those people. and. Um, so I went to one of the social gatherings at MO and uh, even met some relatives that I didn't know I had. And, um, and so I took a contract with them to look at, um, I thought they should address the mental health issues and provide training for their staff. So my two recommendations that were very well received was that um, one was they needed to do research in Métis mental health, and they also needed to train their staff in uh, basic mental health so that when a client came through the door, they could assess them and know what they, who they were dealing with and, and what the illness possibly was. And um, those two, um, the training is going on all these years later, and the... Um, I left just before they, oh, I went on staff with them and worked in uh, family violence and, you know, all those other things. The, uh, um, the training is still going on and it's, it's wonderful. They, uh, um, the attendance at these training sessions is mandatory and it works. So I think that's all you need to know about the life and times. Um, I'm only 12, by the way. <laughs> Looking forward to my teen years. But I just wanted to tell you about the, um, the Métis Nation of Ontario. I don't know how my time is. It, is it up? Five minutes. Oh, I can't do it. But um, the, um, I think when I started with MO uh, in 2005, they were... Um, they had offices in about 20 uh, communities across Ontario, and uh, they, uh, they were wanting to uh, preserve the culture and language of, of the Métis, and also uh, start programs and that uh, Métis could participate in, as well as others who were, uh, were status blind, apparently, and uh, to fulfill the uh, 
principles of uh, uh, prime purpose that the um, organization had uh, laid out. The, um, there's just one more thing. Um, we're actually talking about research ethics, and I had a page of that. Um, anyway, uh, today they're, they're really, um, they've blossomed. Um, and uh, Tony Belcourt was here yesterday, and Tony is the founder of the Métis Nation of Ontario. Um, he's uh, so knowledgeable, but he, the first uh, M&O office was in his attic, in his house, and uh, he was donating his time, and so was everybody else, to build this organization, and it's just, uh, just phenomenal. If I have three minutes left, John, I'll just say that in terms of uh, ethical research, I'd suggest that uh, guidelines ought to be in place to assist the research to learn about the protocol that is in place in the community that they plan to work in. Contacts in the community uh, prior to going in should be made such as uh, preparing yourself to, to know what you're getting into and have knowledge of the community and its residents and its, and its history and its belief system and uh, so that you don't make any mistakes. Um, and uh, meet with the local councils. When we say that, uh, you know, yesterday the word community came up. Another thing that came up yesterday was, uh, what, if, uh, what if we don't, uh, what if we just go in and do the research and get out and they never hear from us again? Well, you will never hear from them either and try getting back in. Um, it's really important to tread lightly and to do your work with the community as carefully as possible and maybe even form a little uh, uh, a mini committee from that community to, to back you up and to advise you. Um, and you need to determine what the etiquette, uh, what etiquette is acceptable in the community. Uh, in Denny communities, uh, at band meetings, if, like the men, uh, and I don't think things have changed, um, the men sit at the table and the, the elders sit at the back of the room and anybody else is sort of on the sidelines. Or they never, you never go to the table unless you're invited. And, um, and you need to realize that although the men are sitting at the table, it's those elders at the, are, who are making the decisions and using incredible sign language. <laughs> and uh, so they're directing the meeting. And I recall one little sweetie pie. She wasn't a researcher. She was just a southerner. Just came in and set her briefcase down on a chair at the table and sat down. Well, <laughs> the room was just... <laughs> silent and um, she just didn't know and it was unfortunate because I think she meant well and she wanted to do a good job of whatever she was doing and then uh, she also advised the chairman of that committee uh, uh, she gave him advice that he didn't want or need because he was busy focusing on the old women but um, it was just major difficulty. And in terms of your questionnaire, have the local people assist you um, in developing the questionnaire. In some communities, you, um, they don't appreciate questions being asked of um, elderly people or even it's sort of a stages of development that questions are appropriate to be asked by someone who, um, like you couldn't ask an elderly man if he still slept with his wife. I mean, you might be worried about, well, do they have enough bed space or is the room ventilated well and this kind of thing. But it's so inappropriate that your research would be over. And uh, it would also be the talk of the community that this is what's on your questionnaire. <laughs> and of course, the question from the community was, does he? <laughs> And, and also, it is so important to uh, uh, 
to be careful of, of what you're asking and in the way it's being asked because um, that could be bad news for you if, if you aren't careful and knowledgeable. And I think that's my time. And uh, I could probably send you this. I'll give it to Laura so that she can send it on to you to, so that you get to know the MNO well. Thank you.